Thank you everyone for joining us. So the Impact Ambassador program uh, is launching these educational donor series. So I thought I'd give a quick primer on what exactly this program is. So the Impact Ambassador program is trying to change the way people give, change the way that people feel confident about choosing the charities that they want to support. It all started with uh, taking a look at the initial charitable sector today. What is trying to find a charity like? Well, it's very confusing. You enter in a question like, which environmental charity should I support in Canada? And then you get something like this. You're overwhelmed by different links pointing to various trusted sources. But the thing is, you still don't really know which one you can choose, which one you can actually trust, which one you'll feel 100% confident with uh, following their advice on which charities to give to. So this is where impact ambassadors come in. Impact ambassadors are leaders in their fields who know exactly which charities are making a difference in their community. And often these can be some of the smaller, more local organizations that the average donor doesn't hear about. So how do impact ambassadors work really quick? They create what's called an impact portfolio. It's very simple. They choose two to five charities that they know make an impact. Donors give to that portfolio. And then the ambassador is able to choose which charities among their portfolio receive that funding based on things like need, programming, if they're close to shutting their doors, all of these things that ambassadors tend to know and, and donors may be in the dark about. So, so far we have 27 impact ambassadors on board, including our lovely speakers that you'll get introduced to today. We have 26 different causes that have portfolios attached to them and so far $130,000 has been given through these ambassadors. Uh, we have experts for every cause from COVID research to wild animal welfare for uh, housing and community support for black communities across Canada. And some very exciting news to kick off today's webinar, all donations to impact portfolios will be doubled until the end of December, thanks to a very generous sponsor. We'll be dropping links along the way. Um, and that's all for me. I'll pass it on to Louisa. Thank you. Thank you, Miranda. So welcome everyone again to those of you who just joined us um, to our Impact Ambassador webinar about the future of food security. We are very excited to have you here and thank you for joining. Uh, we would like to start by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. With us today, we have four knowledgeable and passionate individuals advocating for this cause. We have Jennifer Johnstone, President and CEO of Central City Foundation, Serena Kainer, President of Shushwap Food Action Society, Jisan Kaya, Food Security and Community Development Manager at Whistler Community Services Society, and Tom Cooper, President of City in Focus Foundation. Each one of them has developed a portfolio of charities that they know make an impact in advancing food security across BC. This means that if you care about this issue, their portfolios are one of the best resources out there. And remember that all of your donations to impact portfolios will be doubled until the end of December. And now I have the pleasure to introduce a very special guest, Mark Brand. Mark is a renowned social entrepreneur, chef, and the founder of A Better Life Foundation. I'll let him tell us more about his work and he will be facilitating this conversation for us today. Thank you so much, Mark, for joining us and please take it away. Thank you so much, an honor to be here. As I was sharing just before we went live, it's so nice to get into these groups outside of our isolation for many of us. And so today, I'd just like you to imagine as we're speaking that we are together. I think it's important to put yourself in the conversation because you are a part of the conversation. So anybody who has tuned in here has obviously shown initiative to want to learn more because food is, it's all of us. We are it, it is us. I don't get too, too meta on you, but think, think for a moment. We all come from it, we all go back to it. And so food has been the center point of my life since I can remember. When I was nine years old, I got taught to cook by my aunt, Diane, in the East Coast in Nova Scotia. And my aunt was an alcoholic and a chain smoker and one of the best cooks I ever met. No formal training, could come to my house and pull things out of the cupboard, and there wasn't a lot there, and make incredible food. And she was a magician to me. I genuinely didn't understand because I was taught there was three or four food groups. Things that came out of a can, things that came out of a box, things that came out of a paper bag, or things that my friend's mom's cooked. That's all I knew. It's all I really ever understood. 
And so by spending time with my aunt, who was also a publican, she ran bed and breakfast, she was a bartender, and the rest of my family was in the service industry as well, just hustling to try and get by. By 14, I lied about my age and got my first job cooking pizza at the mall. Now, the job was not cooking pizza, the job was cleaning dishes, but within a day or two, I'd convinced them to teach me how to make dough. That's 31 years ago, and every single thing that I've done in my life from then on, traveling almost every continent and working in every space from creating businesses, B Corps, nonprofits, 501c3s, all the different organizations I run, the consultancies to the FAO and the United Nations, working on the Lodato Sea Challenge with the Vatican, all of it is about food and the production of it, the consumption of it, and the false narratives around it. If we do not focus on it and put it at the center point of everything as a basic human right, then we're lost. If we don't believe that every single person on this planet deserves to have access to nutrition, to food, and that it should be free, then we're going in the wrong direction. And there's a lot of reasons for that. The capitalist structures that have been put in place. They serve some of us, but they don't serve most of us. There is the ability to be entrepreneurial, which I've been lucky enough to do for 25 years, but there's also an extraction mindset. There's not a regenerative mindset. There is the idea that we have little, and what little we have, we must hoard, which is also false. There's an abundance of everything. When we talk about food and the systems at play, we have five, six, seven companies that control the production, manufacturing, and our consumption of most things that aren't, by definition, food. They truly are constructs to get us addicted to sugars, saturated fats, to the cool factor of consuming certain things. And we've lost our way so far that most of us don't even know how to grow it anymore. Growing it should be one of the first things that we're taught to understand how to produce food. And so putting knives in people's hands has been the center point of our work at A Better Life Foundation. A Better Life Foundation was founded in 2013 here in Vancouver as an add-on to a business that I created in the downtown east side called Save on Meats. Now, I didn't create Save on Meats, I created its current iteration, which is, is a social impact incubator. Jargon for, let's try to figure out how to do better things. Let's try and figure out better employment structures. So we work with archetypes of hiring people with diverse abilities. Diverse abilities, not disabilities. Mental and physical diverse ways of interacting. They have superpowers. We prove those models out and have been doing so for 10 years. We create over a thousand meals a day. And from those thousand meals, think about everything from supply chain to end user in a feedback loop that exists within the single room occupancy hotels and our partners to direct feedback from our employees who were formerly in those same situations. We care a lot about this. And then COVID. So giving you that 30,000 foot scope of what I believe in and what I believe our panelists also understand is we are creating more than 3 billion tons. I think it's way higher, but we can use that metric because it makes people comfortable of waste, not leftovers of waste. The damage to the planet and emissions of that waste of food that is not being consumed because it doesn't meet the system is insane. So during COVID, I got locked up here for nine months in Vancouver. I typically spend over 300 days a year on the road. And I was like, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna focus my energy and time on? So two things took my time and then we'll jump into the panel. One was, how do we make our meal program better? How does it service people better in this moment? And we've never addressed waste food properly or leftovers as I'm hoping we will start to call them from our grocery chains in a way that's meaningful enough. We get it to people and often they're throwing it away. That's the ugly truth of that system. How do we actually get it to people? So over the last six months, we've been successful in working with Urban Fair downtown and now with an IGA and bringing on three more grocery stores to our little kitchen on the downtown east side of 43 West Hastings and getting 9 million tons, sorry, 9 tons, 9 million pounds of waste food out of landfill and around 20,000 kilos in offsets of emissions that would have occurred in food that's amazing and delicious and just isn't good enough for the clientele. So they're leftovers. We're able to reconstitute that with one employee and make that happen. The systems exist, we're just not engaging them. The second one was our work in the US was heavily on training and teaching BIPOC kids and their families. 
So I work everywhere from Harlem, Brownsville to Oakland, San Francisco and Los Angeles around Skid Row. And what we were doing is bringing people to and training them on culinary. For those of you that cook, it feels like a difficult conversation to have with people because it's very easy. Cooking is very, very easy. All of us know how to do it. We know what our body actually wants. We're just not listening. And we have this fear of sharp things and heat since the beginning of time. I'm teaching seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds and up, and they are confidently holding a knife within 15 or 20 minutes. I'm just gonna share a couple images that got given to me this morning by our group. So what we did was took the same tools that we're all kind of trapped up in, and those tools are delivery and this. If we're using it, why couldn't we use it as a tool? Why couldn't we still meet people where they are? In an impact work, we're always like, meet people where they are, we carry that baton. What does that mean? It means going to where they are and doing the work where they are and showing up for them. If we took it another level in COVID, it means being in their living room. It means being in their house where their tools are, where they're the most comfortable. So we decided to start delivering groceries. And in those deliveries, we ask all the questions. What do you like? What don't you like? What are you allergic to? What have you always wanted to know how to make? And we get together and we have that discussion with 15 families at a time. And this is what it looks like. Oh, it's gonna be kind of hard to see, but that is joy. And these images I'll share out later on socials. Um, that's what we do for. This is a barrier. Obviously we'd prefer to be in person, but in this we've had eight cohorts of families and upwards of a hundred people in each that has reduced their isolation. You're in a pressure cooker. There's not a lot of money. There's a lot of tension. Jobs are being lost. We deliver critical food and we bring joy. Now, all of these things are part of the system. As people learn about nutrition, about food, about their power, ultimately is what we're teaching. You have the choice. You can do this because the money that you're actually spending on the four food groups I named earlier, you're spending way more than you could at the corner bodega buying the things that you need to make something delicious. When we talk about the last thing that I'll add before we switch gears is we talk about food deserts. And we've always talked about the downtown east side being one and having very few options that are healthy for people to access with money that they have. And that was a gap that we really wanted to fill and we worked hard to do so. Right now, we're closed to forward facing like everybody else. When we think about food deserts and my work and research over the years, we can no longer call them that. They need to be discussed as food apartheid. These neighborhoods are systemically designed to oppress people Big chains don't go there. There are fast food liquor stores and gas stations. There isn't the access that the privileged few enjoy. And when you put something in your body, this reacts instantly. They are intrinsically connected. Without something good in here, which is our core belief of what the thousand meals plus we put out a day, how are you ever expected to get on the right foot? I miss a meal. I'm impossible in a meeting. What if you miss all of them? And we want you to write a resume. We want you to be okay and positive. I'm still here? You're there. Good, good. Small, small hiccup. Um, the powers that be didn't like what I was saying. We want you to feel that somebody loves you. And that is the cornerstone of our work. We believe that the things that we've tried and that we've been working on in poverty and hunger have not worked. That they are pittances, that they are a handout, but they're not truly a system for change. And we have to believe from municipal politics to federal to across, because those are where the agendas are met, that it is a basic human right. And not just overseas, on our own streets and in our own backyards. So that's what I had to say this morning excitedly so the internet better behave um and i almost i want to kick it over back to like louisa or miranda or both to introduce our panelists because i'll gush too long and go on for too long so would you do that for me yeah sure we can reintroduce our panelists today so again we have jennifer jumpstone president and ceo of central city foundation we have serena kaner president of shoe shop food action society 
We have Jisen Kea, Food Security and Community Development Manager at Worcester Community Services Society. And we have Tom Cooper, President of City in Focus Foundation. Again, thank you everyone for being here. Sure. Appreciate you, Louisa. So we're gonna dive into questions and we've got about 40 minutes to spend together. And so just as a point of process, I will call on you, but if you have something burning, please just give me one of these and we'll make sure that you get that comment in because I don't wanna miss anything. And I wanna just also restate, it's an honor to have all of you here. Your work is impressive and a guidebook for many of us trying to do it. So let's start with, let's start with Jennifer. Jennifer, we would love to know how you got your start with Central City and how you see Central City going forward and your personal journey with this. Thanks. Thanks so much, Mark. Hello, everyone. It's really great to be here. Um, yeah, the Central City Foundation journey starts actually back in 1907. Uh, so a small group of Vancouver neighbors came together uh, because they wanted to help their neighbors in need. Um, and that's who we still are today. Uh, although we are a much larger foundation today and we continue to uh, mobilize resources, human, financial, influential, and otherwise, to invest in community-led solutions that help people improve their lives. I've been with Central City Foundation now for just about 14 years, uh, and I am passionately committed to our vision of an inclusive, caring um, community where everyone has the opportunity to participate. The key value at Central City Foundation is when we say everyone, we mean everyone. So everyone who is here belongs here uh, and should have the right and the opportunity to fully participate in our community in all kinds of different ways. And uh, so food security for us is, is a subset of poverty and the deep, you know, the decades of poor policy that have entrenched the terrible legacy of colonialism and systemic racism and misogyny that has created the downtown east side of Vancouver. And we work beyond that in other pockets of what we call the inner city or in and around Metro Vancouver as well, searching for those community led solutions that are co-created with those uh, most directly affected um, by the issues, including food insecurity. So I'll stop there and let other folks have a moment. I appreciate that. And Jennifer's work impacts pretty much every organization that works in the co-creation. When we say co-creation, we mean co-creation. Jennifer literally takes into, into guidance all of the people that you work with on the downtown east side and uses the, that counsel and guidance. Um, and we are very, very honored that she's been with us for seven years, helping to guide our vision as well, along with another dozen or so organizations. So you live your life truly in service, and we appreciate you. Um, Tom. I'd love to shoot over to you and talk about City in Focus and where it is now, where's it, where's it, where has it been and where's it going? Well, City in Focus um, has been in the, uh, in, the, in the province for over 30 years and our tagline has been, we care for the soul of the city. And basically the nutshell is that City in Focus is engaged with building bridges to the city and the people of the city. And you can do that a couple of ways. Uh, you certainly can, in your writing, build bridges between where people live or work and, and faith. But more specific to today, there are building bridges to action. Um, a casual reading of any scripture or any major religion will tell you that it's what you do, not what you say that's important. So what the City of Focus has increasingly done is encourage building a bridge between um, let's just say the powerful and the powerless, let's say the affluent and the less affluent, let's just say the healthy and the unhealthy and trying to connect them by having them meet one another and also trying to have them assist each other. And this has led to uh, uh, millions and millions of dollars being uh, raised to facilitate addressing social issues in our backyard and in British Columbia. And we help uh, religious and non-religious organizations don't care. We just want them to be effective in what they do. Okay. I particularly like that last line and appreciate okay. it. And also, I'm just going to reflect and notice 
the tax that it takes to be in this work this long and to really be inclusive means that the disdain that sometimes we feel for certain things must take a back seat and we've got to center the conversation. So really appreciate yeah. how you show up that way, Tom. Thank you. Uh, we try. Serena, would you like to share with us? Hmm. Okay. So I, I'm actually uh, talking from Sequetmic territory. I'm up in Salmon Arms, which for those who don't know is halfway to Calgary along with Trans-Canada. Um, and our organization um, is a little bit different in that we are also looking at like, I think food security often is talking about household food security. Um, we are also looking at regional food security. So are we actually able to grow the food that we need to eat? So that if, you know, the border ever closed down or something happened in California, there would still be food in BC. Um, so a lot of our work is working with farmers. Um, you know, a big issue in, in regional food security is that farmers cannot make a living farming. <laughs> because of the cost of land and the cost of living and the price that people are willing to pay for food. Um, so so we, we, we also look at household food insecurity, um, but uh, my, my personal journey into this work is, is that my background is a registered dietitian and I, you know, I, I worked in hospitals and so I would see these clients who you know, aren't taking their insulin and then you, you start talking to them and yeah, they live in a trailer and they have four kids and she's a single mom and she can't afford to buy food <laughs> that's healthy and or her insulin. So I really felt ineffective, you know, dealing with these issues on that level because, you know, as a, as a dietitian, I can't change their social reality. Um, so I was trying to, you know, look, look for work that, that looked more at the root causes of these problems. Beautiful. And you touch on something super important, which you're able to navigate personally. And I think as a group is, is so important to focus on, which is the individual, which we impact and the amount that we look at, and then also being able to zoom all the way out and say the system needs to change. And in the interim, we will service the individual. Well, it's, it's a really, really beautiful lens. Um, Gazem, would you like to share with us? So today I'm joining from the unceded and the ancestral lands of the Squamish and the Lowat nations in Whistler today. Um, I first got involved in the nonprofit sector with uh, fundraising for environmental organizations. And a couple of years into it, I quickly realized I'm not making the most amount of impact that I could be in the communities that I'm living. And that's, that's when I started focusing on social justice and social issues. And I was lucky enough to start working at Western Community Services Society where they had already developed um, a food bank service and outreach services and a food recovery program plus food skills and nutrition program. And um, I was blown away by the um, freedom that they had thanks to the social enterprises that they run and the funding that comes from them, um, which allowed us to do the work that the community really needed help with. Um, and I will say one of the key pieces about the food bank that we run is the, we run on the ethical code that we are a Band-Aid solution. And where, where things get really interesting is we have a team of outreach workers that connect with clients when they come, we serve them a hot lunch. Um, and most often there's a reason why somebody needs to access the food bank. And before you put that food into their bellies, you can't really focus on your mental health or your financial um, reasons or physical illnesses and injuries. So once we fed people and connected that with them in a room where we've had couches and dining tables, it created a homey feeling. And that's when people started opening up. That's when people started being able to focus on, oh, you offer legal aid. Let me maybe think about booking an appointment so we can work on those issues that brought me here in the first place. And that's, that was one of the things that I was like, wow, now I can see how we're making impact and in, in, in some real way in our little community. Beautiful, thank you, Gazan. And I, while you were speaking, and I find, you know, we've been in this work a long time, like that exists in Whistler. Of course, we know of your work, but I think for a lot of people, most of the work that's being discussed in this panel today is largely unknown. So it can become overwhelming for people that they don't know there's folks in the work. 
And I think that the more that we can communicate this outwardly, which is what we're trying to do today too, is that there are organizations so people don't go out and start their own without seeing what's already available to support. So in that exact note, I think you touched on something really important, which is how do you make people feel safe in order to help them find the services that they require? And so when we talk about the two, three, five, ten 10-year trajectory for the province of BC, which we're hyper-focused on in this conversation, what do we think will be the steps that are required and who needs to be at the table to get to there? Uh, to the journey that we all hope ends in, in success. And I'd love to start with Serena on this one, if that's okay. Yeah. Do you, you want to just say that one more time? I, Sorry, I, I just got a ping that my mic's a little low. Is that a little bit better for yeah, everybody? That's, thank you. Yeah, that's fine. And then I get into this whisper thing. So, okay, let me, let me just assert again. What I was saying is in the reflection from Gazem talking about how they create space for people to then find themselves into upwardly mobile on a larger scale for a, prov for a province and for Vancouver in general, how do we see ourselves getting there in two, three, five, ten 10 years? What are the components that are going to be required? Who needs to be at the table? How do we get there? Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's a big question. Isn't it? Yeah. Um, well, I can, I can sort of speak from where we are and what we're doing. Um, one of the opportunities that is coming up uh, that really excites me is this idea of the universal school meal programs. Um, and I think there's really big opportunity because kids feel really safe at school. Most kids, not all kids. Um, and, uh, you know, families are connected to schools and it's sort of one of those institutions that, you know, service almost everybody. Um, and, you know, I have this vision of, of local farm, like local food being in, in supporting their local schools. And, you know, again, going back to having farmers being part of the conversation, because um, I think farmers need. The internet is doing it to us again. Let's see. I, I uh, trust, there she is. A trusted area in a manner that maintains their dignity. Right. So, you know, if if school meal programs are universal, meaning that they're open to all students, um, you know, that really protects the the student. And you're also talking about a source of income for a localized farm scene. Mm -hmm. right? So what, what does that look like together? Like it used to look like, what does it look like going forward? And there's two organizations since we're talking about organizations right now that I'd like to give a nod to one being farming hope and the second being um, soul food farms and those two organizations doing in urban areas and on schools, that exact work. And so I think it's young, young it is ag key. Young agrarians is also doing some of that work um, by as um, you know, land matching is a big issue. New farmers going into farming can't afford the land. I mean, I think that's probably the most prevalent issue today. Um, and and totally. can't farm, it's difficult to make a return on your mortgage <laughs> growing carrots, um, which I think is why everyone wants to grow cannabis and, and sort of, you know, grapes and, and these things that aren't really food, um, but just Correct. that it, you can get more money for them. Um, so sure I think so. a big problem that we have is that, you know, the government or, or somebody needs to do something to make farming a viable profession because it's a lot of work. And, you know, if, and a lot of young people whose parents are farmers are not continuing the family tradition because they know how much work it is and they know how much money their parents make. Totally. So reflecting that back, we're talking about getting proper nutrition into our youth to make sure that they have a shot at learning. We're talking about supporting localized farmers with a revenue stream that the government should truly just pay for and offset or subsidize or provide land for. So we're talking about a lot of stakeholders here, right? Yeah. And so you've given us a base to work off or grow off, pun intended. I'd love to jump over to Tom Cooper and hear his thoughts about layering onto that. What else, who else needs to be at play, Tom? Well, I think that, I think the the merger has to be between um, government policy, education, nonprofits, and philanthropists. Um, they need to tag up together. Uh, let's argue by analogy. Let's decide that there's no longer anything called healthcare. We'll just have voluntary groups that offer uh, open up, and if you have a problem medically, you just walk in. 
and you and they'll, they'll help you if they can if they have enough money to stay open they may have a part-time nurse but your health care is a smorgasbord of options and it's a free world and do what you want and uh part of us would go well that's crazy but you go back 50 years in canada that's what you had and they had the local hospital so now the question is go back to what you said mark canada is one of the two countries in the world that has not acted on the national resolution international resolution of the un that food is a basic necessity now once you say it's a necessity all the all the play comes from that principle i would say food and housing is a necessity and getting the basics of life so our, it's good. It's very important what everybody's doing in terms of interim. I love the band aid issue, Jazim. But the, but the, I would say, if we can get the policy to change, if we can go local, the only reason local farming has been put out is by international competition. You shut the international competition of the food cartels, you will begin to have more and more farming. And yes, you do need, by what you said, Mark, subsidizing it, going local. Here's the other thing. The government historically in the states has subsidized bad food. Why not right. subsidize broccoli? Oh no, we're going to subsidize corn and potatoes. So <laughs> it needs an intelligent subsidy, and then if and also then you need uh, enough money, and you need federal policy. Those those would be my thoughts. And then us on the ground of those four issues. Don't kid yourself. Philanthropists can pick up the phone and get to the premier in one call. So Correct. don't leave them behind work with all sectors to get it done right and i think again it's the motivation right so when we speak motivation. to the motivation like how do yeah. we motivate people to do this in the humanity we we try to do the work around creating advocates all day long including those philanthropists and business people to say this is not a them and us there is only us yeah. and this could be but for the grace of somebody yeah. your situation so how do we get people to experience it so I'll that they become I'll part of it exposure i'll give you one example mm -hmm. And my, I want to participate, but anyway, there's a there's a very wealthy guy uh, named Frank Justra, who's given away yeah. hundreds yeah. and hundreds of millions of dollars. Got involved in the food thing, and I said to Frank, "You don't understand it." I took him down, and he served food in a soup kitchen for the mm -hmm. day. Then I took him down to the Vancouver Food Bank. He spent eight hours walking around the food bank. He didn't meet anybody but the executive director, asking why the food, what's the food, where does it go. Who needs it? But those two exposures made him the major donor of the Vancouver Food Bank in the history of the Vancouver Food Bank. He poured hundreds of thousands of dollars in what they needed. You'll need a truck, he bought a truck. You need a freezer, he bought the freezer. But you've got to build bridges between that, and they have to see it. It can't just mm. be something they read about. They have to, we have to try to expose people gently to the issues. I love that lens and appreciate the action work that you also participate in consistently to build those bridges. Jennifer, this is your, I mean, you're in the center of all of this. You've funded tons of the people that have been mentioned already and that sit in your portfolio, which is why I'm so excited that you have one for people to look at, but you also play hard into the game of like property politics. You, you understand this stuff. So what do we need? Yeah. So, I mean, I think, um, in the 113 years that Central City's been doing this, you know, we truly have come to understand that uh, it solutions will come from community, and absolutely those most affected have got to be at the center with meaningful input into the solutions that are created. And so, yes, there is absolutely a role for philanthropy. There's a role for government. There's a role for media. There's a role for academia. Yep. But if, it's, if it is not led by the community-based organizations and those who are on the ground with lived experience, then we will continue to develop and implement solutions from outside community that have negative impacts, unforeseen impacts. You know, um, I think you're going to get into the COVID in a minute, but I think COVID has taught us so much about what's wrong in our approach when we begin from the outside looking in instead of um, investing in those community organizations that are on the ground that can bring people together in meaningful conversations about what will make change, both short term, right, helping people today improve their lives and long term getting at those underlying issues. Because 
you know, there are, there are, there's a, there's lots of, you know, food insecurity for individuals in our country is income insecurity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're not, you know, yeah. not talking about community food security and this, but I'm talking about for individuals, right? And we've had, we had, a, we had, you know, an amazing illustration during COVID of what um, basic income actually looks like mm-hmm. in Canada. Mm-hmm. And for the most part, it was more than double what social assistance is uh, mm-hmm. in any province across the country. And so, you know, the, the, the legislated poverty, as we've called it for a really long time, you mm-hmm. know, is a place where change can happen. Um, but that's not, it's not sufficient, right? And so long, and I think, you know, speaking to, to Serena's points as well, so long as we put profits before people and before this planet, we will not make our way out of this. We will continue to have um, inequitable, unequal uh, distribution of um, income, opportunity, and part and um, and and influence. And so, for me, you know, there's some really there's a really long term vision of of making change, and there's some really specific short term things that people are doing that I think are incredibly important. Some of the cultural based food programs that are emerging from indigenous led organizations, particularly in the inner city, but I know is also happening across the province in different First Nations, Mm -hmm. is really critical to understanding uh, that long-term change that we're looking for that begins to dismantle, um, you know, the the legacy of colonialism uh, across across the province. Um, And food, food is a central part of that. I love that. And I, you know, there's absolutely, Serena, I want to give Gizem some time as well here. Um, I, I just want to double click on folks, if you're listening, the portfolios we're going to share in a second before we go into a Q&A of, of why people chose the organizations, which will bookend beautifully on what Jennifer's talking about right now. But I highly encourage you to seek out the writings of every one of the individuals on this panel today to dig deeper into what these things mean. Because often as a person that's not involved in impact, we hear systemic colonialist, we hear all of these words and we understand at a, at a cocktail party level what they mean. But until we really deeply integrate them into our understanding, we have no hope of being helpful, right? You have to do research and education on your own. So I encourage everybody tuning in today to do that. And you're, you're looking at some of the greatest people doing it. So Gizem, before we jump in, I'm going to give you um, the opportunity to bridge into why you support the organizations you do with your portfolio. But before that, we've talked about system change. We've heard farming, integration of education, the responsibility of government, philanthropy, and the individual. The, the prioritizing of people and planet over profit, the integration specifically of cultural sensitivity and understanding of the people and the original landowners, all of that has been added to this, this map that we're making. What would you like to layer on? And then please just segue straight into what are the organizations in your portfolio and why? That's a very comprehensive list. I will just highlight the importance of poverty reduction work that needs to happen for sure. Um, there's not much more to add to <laughs> the people that spoke before me. So um, I'll just segue straight into the organizations. Um, my number one is Western Community Services Society. And that, that comes from the work that we're able to do. Um, we're able to serve the need of the community and that can change year over year. Um, we were very fortunate to do the work that we do. And then um, the second one is Food Banks Canada um, that supports across the nation, um, any food bank. And then the third one uh, is Zero Ceiling Society. I will say this is a really amazing organization that takes at-risk youth out of the streets and brings them to Whistler, houses them, gives them jobs and a year long mentorship program and teaches them the skills to cook meals and how to do financial budgets. And I would say they are really giving folks the opportunity to um, have some sort of drive, meaning education and mental health support to then carry on their lives as contributing members of this society. All, all super, super important work. And now I'm going to go over to you, Serena, because two things. 
I wanted to honor that you still had something to layer onto that map and we let's let's hear it because I know it's important. Um, and then we also, when we jump into q and A, I'm just going to give you a heads up. The first question is going to be for you and it is about working in rural areas. So if you feel like some of this might layer on, you just let me know. Okay, so I'm going to say something and I just, it's a really unpopular thing to say, but I, I feel like it needs to be said. Um, and is that food banks, like many people realize are not solving the underlying pro problem. But a lot of people are actually saying that it, it, it is one of the factors is that why the problem is not being solved. So food right. banks are, because food banks exist, government doesn't feel like this is an urgent issue because people have access to food. The other thing about food banks is that they really, like from a farmer's perspective, they are really supporting large corporate food, kind of the agribusiness, because the food banks tend to be where companies get rid of surplus stuff they can't sell in the regular market, like you Correct. said, the leftovers. And while it is good that that food is not being wasted in the landfill, it's by get, just being able to give it to the food bank, we're not addressing why there is surplus food being produced. And, and it, farmers can't, com com can't compete with free food, right? So it's sort of one of these situations where if you can get free onions from you know, the food bank, you're not gonna go and support and buy local onions. <laughs> so sure. it's just one of these things where, you know, food banks are definitely necessary to, there are people who need to be fed now. And, and I, you know, I, I can't see taking them away but they, they do, they are complicating the solving of the problem because they're a very right. convenient solution that, that makes people feel good um, giving, but that don't necessarily work for, for the food system itself and for the recipients. For sure. And I want to be very mindful that we don't jump into the rabbit hole of the food bank discussion. I super appreciate your scope. I sit on the New York City Food Bank, one of the largest in the world's culinary council, and I work yeah. directly with them. And I hate food banks. Yeah. So you can hold multiple truths about the system that is currently in play, what needs to happen tomorrow, yeah. what, what critical work is happening, and also the fact that the system should never have been created in the first place can also be a truth. Yeah. But what do we do? To, to, we try and run them side by each, right? And then figure out how they can interact with each other and bring more fresh food. Art Schumann Hess from the food bank here in Vancouver back in like 2011 was like, we're going to work with farmers. The systems are complicated. Yeah. And so I, I really appreciate your scope on that. And I just want to be mindful because I feel like all five of us could do this round table for about five or six days. Uh, so let's not do that today. But thank you, Serena, for adding that. Would you like to tell us about some of the um, organizations that you support and why, given that scope? Yes. So the, the Shushua Family Center, uh, they, they are kind of like our, one of our organizations that work with more, the most vulnerable families. Um, so we, we partner with them. We did, I mean, I, I just, the food. we, we do emergency food aid as well. So we had our farmer's market, we did a shoe box program this summer. So we had families that were identified as needing food and they got a fresh box of food from our farmer's market every week this summer. Uh, we have a community teaching garden that we do with the shoe shop family center. Um, and it's sort of a safe, safe space that they can bring clients to, to work in you know in the soil growing food and then we donate the the produce from the community garden to the food bank um so yeah we are definitely tied closely with the food bank and, and they're our great friends um the second is the indigenous education um department of our school district and uh we've been working with them um doing a a, a number of food security initiatives in schools uh so school meal programs um, we do a family food box for, for, um, indigenous families as well. Um, and I really like them, um, because they are kind of the pulse of the school. They're often working, indigenous educations are often working with the most vulnerable students in school. Um, you know, they, they just are always coming up with really cool ideas and, um, they get Super funded, good. they get funded separately from regular school system. So I really like to support them. That's great. And you can see the other organizations that Serena is suggesting that you support and um, put your put your firepower behind uh, via her ambassador 
page. And so I'm just being mindful of time. We want to jump into Q&A, but if I can give uh, Jennifer and Thomas two minutes each to talk about their portfolio, then we've got a really, really great question uh, from Alexi Stevens. So Thomas, who's in your portfolio and why? Give us your top two. In terms of portfolio, what I give to? Are you talking about yeah, like who who would you recommend in, in the ambassador program? You've obviously got your picks, but who yeah. are your, your your favorites outside of your own organization? Which of oh, course all of us have a strong bias towards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I I um uh, I uh, those change because I come to my conclusions by talking. I agree with Jennifer. Frontline people that are in the midst of the thicket, those who are actually effective, and then empowering them with more resources to be more effective. And that we have given to 50 or 60 different organizations, not just one or two. So I'm loath to raise one or two, but the principle is to don't create a new one, empower the people that are on the front lines that are doing it correctly. And, I, and, and, and because of that, you just have to keep your ear to the ground because we don't really know. Je Jennifer was saying that the frontline people know, right? And when we started uh, more than a roof on on housing, the first person we brought in was Judy Graves. And right. Judy Graves had worked right. homeless for 20, 35 years, and she instructed a group, group of wealthy, powerful people what the real issues are with homelessness. I think that's what has to happen. So that doesn't answer your question, but I can't pick out one or two. Sorry. Don't, no, I think that's a much better response, truly, okay. because we understand why you do what you do. Yeah. So if, if that's an ethos that people agree with, which I hope they do, then they'll, they'll have a look at your folio and, and jump yeah. in there. Um, Jennifer? Yeah, so we support hundreds of organizations through Central City Foundation. When I was approached by Charitable Impact for this program around the ambassador program, it was really, um, you know, at the beginning of the of the lockdown response to COVID in in uh, Vancouver, uh, community organizations on the ground in the inner city uh, began uh, collaborating together in all kinds of new ways and building a new network of support and collaboration. Um, because of course, when everyone was sent home, those folks without a home had nowhere to go. Um, and for and you know, I'm I'm going to challenge you a little bit, Mark, about the concept of a food desert in the downtown east side because until covid we didn't really understand that we hadn't had one right there had there was a network of meal programs there were some long standing community grocery stores there weren't any big chains right there weren't any large grocery stores and things like that but there was a network of of food and food support through the community but when covid hit that just for the most part that disappeared um, and so um, organizations shifted to do to-go meals and unfortunately people had nowhere to go um, and so um, for the first few months um, and continues right now conditions in the inner city of Vancouver are absolutely deplorable and Very true. and so um, you know it's not just I talk a lot about those long-term issues that have entrenched the situation but right now in our inner city um, the effects of COVID on top of the epidemic of, over, of the opioid crisis and the epidemic of uh, vi gendered and sexualized violence has created um, just horrible, horrible conditions in which people are starting or trying to survive. The beginning of COVID, what we saw across the community was organizations pivoting to providing food and food security because it became an issue for many, many people. And in the inner city, there were two organizations, uh, Potluck Cafe, which is a social enterprise organization that actually grew out of something called the Binner's Dinner some 25 years, 20, 25 years ago. Um, and is, has been creating uh, employment and uh, nutritious food for the inner city since then with uh, partners like A Better Life Foundation, brought everyone together to organize a centralized food distribution uh, we managed to bring together a whole network of peer support workers who began to distribute that food along with PPE and information and support. And until the second wave, had, they had done an amazing job of keeping people safe from COVID mm -hmm. in a community where there's no such thing as social distancing and people can't isolate at home because there is no home. So, so Better Life Foundation and Potluck Cafe are both in my portfolio, as is the Vancouver Food Bank 
primarily because of the community food hub system that was quickly deployed um, uh, to redistribute food from the food bank because when, again, when people were sent home, most of the depots were closed in Vancouver. And so everyone had to move to a new system to try to ensure that people had access uh, to at least a minimal amount of nutrition. Um, and so, and organizations like A Better Life uh, Foundation and Potluck Cafe together um, managed to distribute um, hundreds of thousands of additional meals to people on the street and living in, um, in single room occupancy hotels in the downtown east side. So that's why they are on my list. Thank you, Jennifer. And um, the, we did, we put out just under 400,000 additional meals during the pandemic. And I appreciate your, um, your pushback on the availability of food. And I, I think I'll, I'll retort, if you will, with our friend, Judy Graves, who is already centered, who said, if you would like to spend your life lining up, you can eat as much as you want. And I think there's often, if you have food, if you have money, you have access. Um, and what is the access to that food for? So there's a constant ebb and flow discussion of what it is you're eating and how you're getting it and what it looks like. And you were right during the pandemic. A lot of those folks who came out of the goodness of their heart from the Sikh and the Muslim community to come down and distribute food every day disappeared. So we really appreciate your work in helping to center the voices of all of the different organizations that we get a chance to work with as well, a deep honor to work with. And it's, it's been quite a ride, but I wanna just also reflect something else that you shared, which is we've seen a way to support individuals with a UBI or universal basic income that is a way that we could afford as a country. Now we say this debt is climbing and I'll just add this one stat, which is we know factually that it costs us as taxpayers in a government two to three times more to have an individual unhoused than it would to house them and provide wraparound services. This is a North American fact and I've spent six years of my life digging deep, deep into it. So it's true. So when we say there's not enough money to give people UBI, that's a lie. There is more than enough to provide them with everything, the basic right of a house and the basic right of food and services and mental health care and, and, and. Um, okay, so I want to dive into these, these questions. Um, I find myself just like soaking up knowledge as we're going here as well. Um, and the first question was for you, Serena, which was, what are the five that it's disappeared from the questions? Unfortunately, I'm going to try and bring it back up here. I I answered it. I, I typed oh, the answer. Um, <laughs> amazing. Folks, you could just jump in the Q&A. Serena went ahead and did some homework um, in the middle of the session, which is the kind of overachiever she truly is. Uh, and so that answer is there, and I'm sure it can go out in an email as well. And so I think I would like to then jump to Rob Bancroft, because this will be a fun one for us all to sort of finish. And we got three minutes left, and I want um, Gazem to jump in on the front of this, there are knock on economic consequences of the pandemic. We just finished talking about the, the consequences of the pandemic on the most marginalized that we will likely see in the coming months and years. Where do you see changing needs and vulnerabilities? And are there things that we can address to do so that we can do to address them now? For sure. And I'd like to highlight a couple of the things that I've seen our community has started doing. Um, I was lucky enough to sit in a food task force meeting where we're in the Squamish Lillooet district where they are working on developing, for example, a label. So what you can't um, identify, you can't buy. So they're coming up with a brand that will identify local growers and farmers. Then our local consumers will be able to say, wow, this was actually grown in Squamish up to Lillooet. So I'm going to support our local farmers. Um, that's the piece of the the community food insecurity part. Um, the other piece on the individual level, what we're seeing is, for example, in Whistler, we are a tourism based economy. We have the town runs on young individuals and families who work for hotels, hospitality, and who almost make um, less than it, it's ne never living wage. So I'd like to challenge the employers to st who are in a tough spot right now. But this is where the basic income comes into play. We need to pay, start paying people living wage. And the more money they have, the less they're going to rely on the services. And yes, as organizations, we run a fine line between fulfilling the need that the government needs. But until then, we're going to continue serving people because when there is a month long wait for someone to access free counseling services, we can't close our doors and say, no, no mental health 
support for you. So I think we have to continue running the programs that we are at the moment um, with, with new, like Jennifer was mentioning, our community's needs are very specific. So the organizations mm. on the ground are gonna know that. So the thing that I would also like to challenge funders is funding sometimes, most often comes with restrictions and you need sure. wages, you need unrestricted funds to really do the work that you're, you're meant to do. Um, one of the, the things we're working on right now is putting a self-serve mini fridge in each classroom in five schools in Whistler so that kids can have access to free food. So our organization is taking on that type of programming to be able to serve right. the upcoming year's challenges that people are going to um, encounter with no jobs, no income. So we're still sure. trying to fulfill that food and security need. And yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, Kazan. <laughs> and I just, I want to uh, just surface an energy that's obviously here, which is like, all of us have heard these solutions in different formats. That doesn't mean they're not still good ideas. And on a ground level, servicing your community directly with one of these things is a is always a good idea in my mind. What's the right now, right? And so in this in this next, who's hungry today? How do we build out from there? So I really appreciate the work that you do and also for sharing with us today, Gazan. Um, Tom, I'm going to jump over to you and we've got sort of 60 seconds each here to, to close up and, okay. and thoughts. I think um, uh, I think someone once said that we we shouldn't waste a crisis. Mm. Uh, I think I think it's clarified the downside of capitalism, of greed. It's clarified that the marginalized are even more marginalized. Um, I think the top twenty five percent of Canada or the U.S. is booming. Look at the stock market at all time high, and you have more people in America and in, uh, in despair than ever. So I think for me, I think it's what are the lessons that we've learned that COVID has forced us to see mm -hmm. and not forget it. Let's build new policy around it at the government level. And I agree with all the solutions that are mentioned here. And it's gonna be all shoulders on deck. And because of my organization comes from a faith background, um, I'll end with this quote, uh, 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 faith without works is dead. The church has gotta be at the front line actively encouraging a generosity and social change and policy change to help people address the issues of uh, living a basic life of food necessities and housing. Appreciate the vigor at which you do this and, and really the straight talk today. I appreciate you, Tom. Um, Jennifer. Sorry, I lost the question. <laughs> uh, you've got 60 seconds to summarize any feelings you've got right in this moment or anything that you would like to leave the 100 plus folks joining us today. Yeah, with. I mean, I think, I think that um, we have found during this latest crisis uh, that um, there are uh, organizations out there that are doing amazing work um, on the ground and have had the opportunity to, to shift in how they can support folks and have really stepped up during this crisis. Um, those are what we would call community-led community -led solutions at Central City Foundation and found ourselves being, being consulted by a lot of folks about you know, how to find those organizations and how to support those organizations. And I think, um, I think that they are around every corner in every neighborhood, uh, luckily enough, in, certainly in British Columbia. Um, and need that need that uh, support one of the things that was most remarkable in the in the crisis was the pivot to unconditional uh, unrestricted operating funding uh, that we were able to secure from organizations like the vancouver foundation for the first time in history um, and i add my voice to those saying the more we can do of that uh, that we can base our philanthropy on trust uh, yep. and uh in the organizations that are doing such amazing work, the stronger the community will be and the less uh, food insecure we will be. Love all of that. And um, as a 15 year resident of this neighborhood, uh, the appreciation we have for you and Central City Foundation knows no bounds. And, and really in that work of those unrestricted funds, a lot of work got done because of that. So thank you um, from everybody I know. <laughs> Serena, um, any closing remarks? Um, there was a question in the chat just about, you know, someone was saying, that, you know, if you have some money to spend on food, 
you know, what's something you can do. So of course, we are always encouraging people to support your local farmers, uh, either at a farmer's market or through a, case, um, a CSA box. Um, and uh, just getting to know, you know, the people who are growing your food and, you know, the amount of work that it is. Um, I think growing, I think, you know, one of the biggest benefits of starting your own garden, even if it's like a pot in your windowsill, is that you come to appreciate <laughs> how difficult it is to grow food and that it's actually a skill that, that a technical skill that, you know, takes farmers years and years to, to, to get good at it. It's an art. So, um, I think just appreciate, I think when people start to appreciate their food and start thinking about where the food came from, the conditions in which it was grown, it kind of helps connect the dots on some of the problems that we are facing in our food system today. Love that. Thank you so much. And before I turn it over, I just want to say it's been an honor to hold space with you guys today. Um, truly given me lots to think about as always. And I look forward to continuing to be on the front lines with you. So ladies, it's yours. Thank you so much, everyone, Jennifer, Serena, Sam, and Tom. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise today and sharing all of your perspectives. We learned so much from this conversation. And a special thank you to Mark, of course, for guiding this conversation. It was fabulous. To everyone who joined us, thank you. We'll be sending each one of you 10 terrible dollars to support the impact portfolio of your choice. So stay tuned for that. And also we'll be sending along the recording of the webinar. Remember all your donations will be doubled until the end of December. So this is the best time to give to these portfolios. And we hope you learned a lot as much as we did and have a nice rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Blessings, thank you. Bye.